Yes, what is it? Matt, okay, thank you. Okay, are we, oh, is everybody ready? Six o'clock. Everybody ready? Yeah. We're, yeah. <laughs> okay, it's about six o'clock, a little after. Is everybody prepared, ready? We have, hello, and welcome to the Capitola Planning Commission meeting. This meeting is open to the public with both in-person attendance at the City of Capitola Council Chambers at 420 Capitola Avenue and remote viewing is also possible. The Planning Commission and staff are attending in person and members of the public wanting to offer public comment need be present. The public can live stream the meeting on the city's website on YouTube or on Zoom following the link on the meeting agenda. As always, this meeting is cablecast live on Spectrum Communications Cable TV Channel 8 and AT&T Uverse Channel 99 and is being re-recorded to be rebroadcast on the following Mondays and Fridays at 1 p.m. on Spectrum Channel 71 and Spectrum Channel 25. A recording of the meeting will also be available on the city's website after the meeting. Our technician tonight is Matt, and as a reminder, please turn off your cell phones during the meeting. Okay, um, do we have one have a roll call? Yes, Commissioner Esty. Here. Commissioner Westman. Here. Commissioner Wilk, here. Vice Chair Jensen, here. And Chair Christensen, here. All right, Pledge of Allegiance. Moving on to item two. So wait for everybody to get settled. Everybody settled? Everybody good? Okay. Um, item two is additions and deletions to the agenda. We have an item A. Yes, staff did receive additional materials for tonight's agenda related to item 5A. That included 17 emails, one letter, and presentation slides. These have all been added to the agenda packet sent out via email and also are available in the back of the room. Thank you. Okay, um, item three is oral communications. <clears throat> Members of the public may speak for up to three minutes unless otherwise specified by the chair. Individuals may not speak more than once during oral communications. All speakers must address the entire legislative body and not be permitted to engage in dialogue. A maximum of 30 minutes is set aside for oral communications. Is there anybody who would like to speak? And this is for this items is not this is items not on the agenda. This is not on the agenda. Yes, this is just for just for general oral communications. Can you can you? We have to speak directly into the microphone, or else it doesn't pick up our voice. Just so you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but if you need something repeated, just give me a little signal. Um, not on the agenda. Okay, hearing none. Moving on to the public hearing, item five. Public hearings are intended to provide an opportunity for public discussion of each item listed in the public hearing. The following procedure is as follows. One, staff presentation. Two, planning commission questions. Three, 
public comment, four, planning commission deliberation, and five, decision. Item A is the citywide zoning code update. Do we have a staff presentation? Yeah, excuse me, Chair. Um, actually, I think we missed item four, which Ooh. is planning commission Sorry. communications and staff communications. So we'll take one step back and then we'll move forward. Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> so item four is planning commission and staff comments. Is there any comments? No. Do you have any comments from staff? No, I just wanted um, to remind everyone to please speak into the mic. And tonight when we take public comment, also it's very helpful to speak into the mic. We record all of these, the meetings. And for folks at home who are interested in the subject matter, it's really important. So thank you. Thank you. OK. Hearing none. Uh, moving on to the public hearing. Um, as stated before, we're um, starting off with the staff presentation. For item A. Okay, we are pulling it up now, and but we're having an issue with this the monitor behind. Um, which mm -hmm. one is on? I know. <laughs> Sorry. Talking to Apple. 
I've got four. Yeah. <laughs> what did they just say? Uh, see, click this and I'll take control. <laughs> That's what they said. Can I have access to your screen? Yes, you may. <laughs> okay, hi, everyone. We're going to take, can I have your attention really fast, everyone? We're going to take about, can everybody hear me? Thank you. We're going to take about six minute break, maybe six, six minutes. Reconvene at, well, let's do, So we're taking a five minute break. We're hopefully gonna get the technology fixed, but at the same time, we're making more copies of the presentation so that we can do this uh, with paper if necessary. Thank you.
I just followed the path plugged in directly to my cloud. It was on this. Did you do the presentation to the first computer? Press one? No, it was only router two. This is just my personal. Yep, it's on to you. Oh, look. This will make it mute.
Do you have a, you have the copy there? Chair Christensen, I think we're ready to go. I think the tech is on and we can, um, if we could have everyone. Right. Everybody, can we have your attention? We're ready to go. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Resuming staff presentation. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you all for being here tonight. And I'm really sorry about the tech uh, issue. And we just really appreciate we've been going through our I'm Katie Hurley. I'm the Community Development Director for the City of Capitola. And we've been going through our housing element update for the past two and a half years. And we're almost at, um, at certification with the state. And the next step is to come into compliance with the housing element and implementation. So it's really important to get these community conversations started. Um, I'm going to go through a few of our slides, and then I'll be introducing our team. Actually, I'll do the introductions now. We've got Sean, Sean Sasanto, the associate planner, who's managing this project, the zoning code updates, and Ben Noble with Ben Noble Planning, who helps us, uh, who drafts the updates within our code and our maps. Um, so uh, the meeting focus tonight is on the multifamily zoning district, and the which is referred to as the RM district. So you'll hear us say RM, and that means multifamily district. Um, then we'll, after we talk through the multifamily district, we will be taking public comment on that item alone. And then, because we know a lot of people are here for that item specifically. And then we'll move into our other new amendments related to housing on religious sites, retail cannabis um, locations, uh, office uses in our regional commercial zone, and also good standing provisions. So that's what the evening is going to entail. Next slide, please. Um, so one, one item I wanted to touch base on is since we've published the agenda, we've had a lot of um, interest, and it, which makes sense. We're, we're looking at some intensifications within our multifamily zoning. And I wanted to bring forth to the Planning Commission that this item that the multifamily is not a requirement to be completed within 2024. We've had a lot of questions about the timing. Um, why is this happening so fast? I just received my notice. Do we need to make a decision within 10 days? Um, so we are, I, I would like to report that this, this amendment, there's quite a few amendments that are required to happen in 2024 tied to our housing element. The multifamily is not one of them. So tonight when we ask Planning Commission for direction after this item, we've created two options within our recommendation. We can either tie these into the 2024 updates or we can focus in on our 2024 updates, which are required by state law to be completed by the end of this year, and then um, redo our public notice um, on for this and take in the, the, all the um, points and all the public comment that's made tonight and direction from Planning Commission so we can continue evolving the, the zoning code amendments and then come back to you with the next set, like the, the update based on what we hear tonight and the direction given from Planning Commission. So we'll be asking for Planning Commission's direction after the public hearing on, on how you would like to proceed. And with that, we'll go to the next slide. Um, and the purpose of the meeting tonight is really to receive public comment and planning commission direction. And I just can't emphasize enough that this is really our first um, public notice on this item, the first opportunity for the public really to be engaged in this item and talk and let us hear uh, your thoughts. And then we will, with the direction of planning commission, be amending this, the draft code and we can come back with um, more information and more analysis. So. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Ben Noble. Thank you, Katie. Again, my name is Ben Noble. I'm the city's consultant assisting with the zoning code amendments. 
And before getting into the RM zoning district topic, I wanted to provide some very high level background on how we got to this point and the regulatory framework for it. So I think as many people know, the city has a general plan, which is the long-term uh, planning document for the future of the city. It identifies allowed land uses, um, the maximum permitted intensity of those land uses throughout the city, as well as other policies related to land use, conservation, and development in the city. One of the chapters or elements of the general plan is the housing element, and state law has very detailed requirements for what the housing element must contain. And it's the plan for the city to provide for housing over the next eight or so years. And as Katie mentioned, the city has been uh, updating the housing element as required by state law, has been working with the state agency um, to make revisions to that document so that um, it is in compliance with state law and can be certified by the state. So that's the general plan with the housing element being one component of the general plan. The city also has a zoning code, which is the development regulations that implement the policies within the general plan. And the zoning code contains more specificity about allowed land uses, as well as development standards uh, such as height, setbacks from property line, uh, parking, and other details like that. And so um, the uh, general plan update uh, identifies revisions to the zoning code that need to be made in order to implement the housing element and comply with state law. So a big part of the reason that we're here tonight is that uh, the city needs to identify amendments to the zoning code that are needed in order to comply with the updated housing element. So that, uh, in a nutshell, at a very high level, is background on uh, where how we got to this point um, tonight. And so over the last couple of months, the Planning Commission uh, has been meeting uh, to look at uh, and to talk about amendments to the zoning code that are needed to implement the housing element, as well as to make other uh, changes to the zoning code to address issues um, that need attention. And so over the last couple of months, the Planning Commission has been holding study sessions um, to discuss at a high level uh, potential amendments to the zoning code. Um, and they've given staff preliminary input and have provided direction to staff to prepare materials for further discussion, uh, as well as for public review and comment. Uh, so we're still at the phase of um, the Planning Commission study sessions uh, and beginning to look at specific draft amendments for discussion and feedback to staff, as well as receiving public comment. And so the maps that identify proposed changes to the RM zoning districts. Tonight is the first night that they've been before the Planning Commission and the first night that um, members of the public have had an opportunity to review these um, and to provide comment. So um, we expect and we welcome uh, a discussion about those materials and further direction on how to proceed. So with the zoning code amendments, um, after the Planning Commission has provided feedback on um, the materials at the study sessions, then we move into public hearings. And so later this year, the Planning Commission will hold uh, public hearings um, and provide a recommendation to the City Council on the zoning code amendments. And it's ultimately the City Council who adopts those amendments, considering the Planning Commission's recommendations and um, public comment received on the amendments. And so, as Katie mentioned, there are some amendments uh, called for by the housing element that need to be completed this year, and there are others 
um, that can be completed next year. And there's a slide later in the presentation with a little bit more detail um, on that. But there are some zoning code amendments um, where the city is required by state law uh, to uh, adopt those amendments by the end of 2024. Okay, and here's the slide, speaking of which. Um, so by December 2024, uh, there are some zoning code amendments that need to be adopted. So rules about no net loss of, of affordable units if a housing site with existing affordable units is redeveloped, uh, incentives for mall redevelopment, uh, changes and updates to the density bonus ordinance, emergency shelters, homeless shelters, uh, replacement housing if sites with uh, affordable units are redeveloped, um, as well as other special needs housing provisions such as transitional supportive housing, farm housing, for example, all required to be uh, completed by the end of this year. And as Katie mentioned, there are some other zoning code amendments uh, that can be completed next year. The RM zoning changes uh, are one of those. Um, and then there's some others as well, where the housing element identifies a completion date that's 2025. So after um, presenting some of the content of the RM uh, zoning district proposed changes, um, one of the things that we'll be asking the Planning Commission for feedback on is um, whether or not the RM uh, amendments um, should um, be deferred until next year to allow for continued public discussion and revisions. Okay, so now a little bit more getting into the RM zoning district amendments in particular. And as I mentioned previously, the impetus behind these amendments is the housing element, the city's uh, policy document for housing in Capitola. And there's one of many programs uh, in the housing element related to the RM zoning district is program 1.6. And what this program says is that by the end of 2025, the city needs to assess the maximum densities allowed in the RM zones and determine if higher densities can help facilitate multifamily development. Also, the city needs to review and revise um, development standards, such as setbacks, parking, and height to ensure that they're necessary and pertinent and do not pose constraints on the development of housing. So the discussion that we've had previously in the materials tonight, uh, there before the Planning Commission, because of this program, uh, where we're looking at the RM zoning districts throughout the city and considering whether or not uh, densities need to be revisited and if development standards need to be adjusted to uh, accommodate and provide for the densities in those areas as envisioned by um, the zoning code. And so one of the things that the um, housing element contains is a map of adequate sites. Uh, and these are sites uh, based on state law that demonstrate that the city of Capitola has sufficient opportunity for new housing to be built um, consistent with state requirements. Uh, and so this is a map um, from the housing element, and you can see that there are a lot of sites that are outlined in pink. Those are the uh, identified sites that are available in the housing element for future residential development. And as you can see, the vast majority of these sites are within the uh, commercial and mixed-use corridors on 41st Avenue, on Bay Avenue, and Capitola Avenue, for example. These are all sites that are not zoned RM. Uh, they're zoned um, community commercial, regional commercial, or mixed-use. Uh, there are a few identified sites in the housing element that are zoned RM. They're shown on the screen here so um, the city needs to be mindful of the development standards that um, apply to these identified RM sites to ensure that the development standards are appropriate 
um, to allow for the number of units on these sites as identified in the housing element. And so, Katie, I think you had maybe a few other things to say. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to chime in on this slide. So citywide, we're required by the state to build 1,300, or not to build, I apologize, to plan for 1,336 units over the next eight years. So when we plan for things, it really means that our general plan has to align with our zoning code and the zoning code has to, when we look at our maps and our available sites, um, make sure that there's availability to build 1,336 units. And as Ben stated, the majority of the, the development that we're proposing is in our commercial zones. So the Bay Avenue corridor as you come into the city as well as the 41st Avenue corridor because the majority of our commercial is single story commercial and there's a great opportunity there. It's near transportation to go up, be more dense and have um, housing above. So this slide um, of the 1,332 units, we're showing there's um, less than 80 units within the multifamily that are identified. So I think that should bring a lot of relief to the room of like, we're not, our site's inventory is not placing all of the, the units within our multifamily because all of our, our multifamily is built out um, primarily. And in order to densify in multifamily, you'd have to really, the, the economics of it just does not work unless you uh, go much higher and, um, so what we've proposed is there's on Clara Street, five units, so two to the north, three to the south. One is a developer interest, or actually both of these, both sites, the, um, the property owners have shown some interest in um, providing units. Um, Capitola Gardens was identified for 16 sites. Um, right now, they, they actually came in for an administrative permit, which is allowed by state law for two ADUs. So, we um, identified Capitola Gardens as a site in which could accommodate 14 units. Going through the housing element update, I think at first we proposed that number higher and we brought it down to 14 because we know that's a site that um, there's a lot of enjoyment of the public open space there and the openness of the site. Um, and then for 1098 38th Avenue, this is a project that um, was approved this year and it counts towards this next housing cycle and it's for 52 units. It's 100% affordable. It's a mid-pen development. So of, of the 80 or so units, um, 19 are pending in the multifamily in, in terms of what we've planned for for redevelopment. So, and we're not the developer, it's if projects were to come in on those sites. And then this is just an image to show the 1098 38th Avenue project that has 52 units. So with that, I'll go back to Ben. Thanks. So can I ask a question? Yes. Um, this, it confuses me a little bit. So you, the, the items you arrowed, you pointed to the arrow, there's, they're significant other than the others in terms of the pink arrow because those are the specific ones that you're proposing we rezone, or are you just saying that these are examples of ones that are in development? No, so these are the sites. So in our sites inventory, we had to identify enough sites to cover the 1,300 new units. And these that are identified are the only sites in our inventory that are in the RM zoning district. Ah. So we've pulled out, like we, we blocked out the rest of the sites, they're in pink. Um, but we're identifying the four sites that were included from the RM district. There are no other sites in our inventory for the housing element that are multifamily sites. So when you talk about rezoning um, to comply with the minimum housing element requirements, we're talking about all the ones outlined in pink or red, but those are mostly items that are in a different, not the RM zone, but our commercial zone or whatnot. And so we're talking about yeah, we need to worry about those, but in terms of this meeting, the only RM units that the HCD really cares about are the ones that you've arrowed. Okay, that is a great question. So within our housing element, many, many cities have been told that they need to rezone properties. We are not one of them. 
we can fit this zoning within our existing zoning. So it's just we've identified these locations that can accommodate these additional, the additional 17 units or 19 units, sorry. So there, we're not, do, we're proposing a rezone and we'll get to this next because we have so many properties in the multifamily that are out of compliance. Um, our, our multifamily goes up to 20 dwelling units per acre and I would say at least half of the multifamily is not in compliance with that because they have densities higher than 20 dwelling units per acre. So we're not required by the state law, by the state at this point to do a rezone. We are opting to do a rezone to bring ourselves into compliance. But, um, so we'll go to the next slide, please. Is, can I, can Is that some making, I see some, yeah, some clarity? Okay. Sure. So if you look at the housing element, which is published on the uh, city's website, uh, in Appendix D, it, li it lists every property, virtually every property in the city, and it says what zone it's in now and what the opportunity is to, to increase the development because we got to get to this 1336 number. And, and let's take the mall, for example, because that's our largest target. There's one, there are multiple properties at the mall, as it turns out. There are five, I think, in total. One of them, for example, uh, I can't read the numbers in small print, but anyway, it, we're proposing adding 242 units on that one property on the mall of the five that are there. And I forget the total number for the mall, but it's a large number. And, and that's true also for the Bay Corridor, where on the, the CC, um, in the CC coding, right, it's not multifamily, it's commercial community. Uh, we're adding, you know, another large number of properties, potential uh, for development. All of this stuff is potential for development. We can't force anybody to develop anything, right? We have to entice people to come in and develop to make up our number of 1336 units over the next six years, right? Because it's a six-year right. program. Eight years. Eight yeah. years. So that's that's what we're struggling with. Where to, where can we plunk things in the future to meet our numbers? I hope that helps. Okay. So now we'll thank you very much. So now we'll get into some more details of the RM zoning district and the rules for those properties. And a lot of this has to do with allowed density and the maximum density. And so just as a refresher that um, density is expressed as the number of dwelling units per acre, or dwelling units per acre. And there's a simple uh, formula that one uses to calculate that um, based on the number of units in the lot area. So it's dwelling units per acre equals number of units divided by lot area. So on the screen is an example of how uh, density is calculated. So for example, on a 6,000 square foot lot, which is 0.14 acres, um, if you have three units on the lot, uh, density is calculated as three divided by 0.14 and that results in a density of 21 dwelling units per acre. So just as a reminder of how the density calculation um, is calculated. Okay, so here is the city's existing zoning map. Uh, and it has a lot of colors on it. Uh, most of the city is uh, yellow, which is single family residential, and we're not doing or talking about any changes to those areas. Uh, what we are looking at are the RM, the residential multifamily subzones. And there are currently three of them. They're shown in brown on the slide. There's the RML, um, which allows up to 20, 10 dwelling units per acre. It's the lightest brown. RMM, which allows 15 dwelling units per acre, the medium brown. And RMH, uh, multifamily high density residential, which allows up to 20 dwelling units per acre. And for all of, for each of the RM subzones, there are development standards uh, that address uh, topics like height, building coverage, and setbacks. And so this slide shows some of these development standards. Currently, there's a maximum height of 30 feet in the RML and the RMM, and 35 feet in the RMH. 
building coverage, um, which is the percentage of the site that's occupied by a building, um, and all of them is 40%. And then below that are the setbacks, 15 feet minimum front setback. Um, there are in, uh, interior side setback of 10% of the lot width, street side setback of 10 feet, and rear setback of 15% of the lot depth. So one of the things that the city is required to do by the housing element is to look at these standards and consider whether they are an unreasonable constraint on housing production in Capitola, and if so, uh, how they might be modified to uh, remove that constraint in a manner that's reasonable and appropriate for the city. So uh, as you may recall, at prior meetings, we talked about the situation of uh, non-conforming development within the RM zone, development that's not non-conforming for density. So existing development on the ground where the current density exceeds what is allowed under the zoning code. And here are some images. Um, these are from the housing element itself that identify some of these non-conforming multifamily sites where, for example, the 850 and 870 park the maximum allowed density is 20 dwelling units per acre, but what is built is 32 dwelling units per acre. And there are a number of uh, RM sites with a similar situation. And one of the conversations that we've had is whether or not it would be uh, beneficial to the city um, to change the allowed density on these and other properties so that the maximum allowed density in the zoning code is consistent with what is built on the ground. Here are some other examples. Capitola Mansion that allows 15 dwelling units per acre developed at 34 dwelling units per acre. Uh, 501 Plum Street allowed 15 dwelling units per acre built at 37 dwelling units per acre. 1945-42nd allows under the zoning 15 dwelling units per acre but built at 38 dwelling units per acre. So um, as you may recall, at prior meetings, we looked at these images and considered whether or not the existence of these non-conforming properties in the RM zone um, is relevant to our discussion of potential changes to the RM development standard. So in two meetings in particular, we talked about this in more detail on May 2nd, uh, we discussed options for the RM zoning district amendments and the Planning Commission directed staff um, to look further at existing non-conforming multifamily property, um, the existing land uses surrounding the RM properties, as well as environmental constraints. And really wanting a site-specific consideration of the appropriate density on the different RM sites. And on June 6, uh, we looked at this in more detail, uh, at which staff proposed uh, RM densities ranging from 10 to 40 dwelling units per acre, um, with the goal of bringing uh, existing non-conforming properties in the RM district into compliance with the density standard. And based on that meeting, the Planning Commission requested a draft zoning code uh, amendment and text amendments uh, consistent with uh, the materials that were presented on June 6. Uh, the Planning Commission also requested uh, enhanced public noticing that goes above and beyond the minimum state and city requirements um, to make sure that uh, residents within the vicinity of these RM properties were aware that this discussion was occurring. Okay, so that um, then brings us to the proposed zoning map amendments. And I have a series of slides um, that uh, replicate what is in the packet and what has been provided on the rear table. And um, what, what we have proposed for discussion is um, five subzones ranging from a maximum density of 10 which is equivalent to the RML, existing zoning district, to a maximum of RM40, 
which is equivalent to some of the higher density residential properties that currently exist within Capitola in terms of what's built on the ground. So that book ends um, our density range that we're looking at. Um, and we've applied um, these proposed densities to all of the existing RM properties based on uh, a number of criteria. And um, those criteria include the existing density on the ground, uh, the presence of environmental constraints, uh, and the uh, surrounding properties in terms of the uh, predominant land use and the neighborhood character. So we really tried to look at this in a site-specific manner uh, to consider what would be the appropriate allowed density in all of these areas. And so we've, as we've done in pri prior meetings, we've um, divided it into sort of some sub areas so to facilitate discussion. And we'll start with the area around um, Cliffwood Heights, which we're calling the Northeast area. And the map on the left uh, is the revised zoning map that shows the um, proposed zoning. And then the table on the right is a little summary um, where there's an identifying number. Uh, and then for each of those numbers, um, information about what the existing zoning is, um, what the built density is of actual development that exists currently on the property, um, and what the proposed density is. And um, I won't go into detail on each of these, but I'll point out a few things. The pink, uh, the cells that are highlighted with a pink color identify um, uh, places where the allowed density would increase over what is currently allowed. Um, so for example, in the area identified as number one uh, on this, um, the proposed change would increase the allowed density from 10 dwelling units to 20 dwelling units per acre. Uh, and for some of these, there's a footnote number one, which indicates that the purpose of um, the proposed change to the allowed density in those cases was to legalize the existing development density and to eliminate the non-conforming situation. So you can see that there are quite a few where that was one of the primary intents behind the change to the zoning. So if planning commissioners um, have specific questions about individual properties, we can get into it. But um, in the uh, interest of um, minimizing the length of the presentation, I'll just you know, point out a few other things. Um, this is the north central area where you can see there are a lot of these different sites. And again, the, where the pink color appears, that's where there is a um, proposed increase in the allowed density. Um, in the village, uh, there's no uh, proposed increase in the allowed density. In the northwest area, um, there are a number. And then here again in the southwest area, you can see it's um, area number four. That's the only one where there is a, a proposed increase in the allowed intensity with the purpose of um, eliminating a non-conforming situation with um, existing development on the ground. Okay, so those were maps that were identifying the um, proposed allowed densities in the RM zoning districts. And the second piece of this is to look at the development standards. Uh, so under state law, the city needs to have development standards that would allow for the, um, that would accommodate the maximum allowed density within the zoning district. So the city is committed to looking at the development standards in the RM zoning district and evaluating whether or not um, they need to be adjusted in order to allow for the amount of residential development um, that can be accommodated in those zoning districts. So uh, on this slide and on the next slide are some of the proposed um, RM development standards that uh, staff believes um, are necessary in order to accommodate um, the proposed densities. And so the standards that would um, so are new and modified from what exists today are shown in the red. 
old text. So for example, um, uh, with density, uh, the city currently allows up to 20 dwelling units per acre, but doesn't allow more than that. So 30 dwelling units per acre in RM30 and 40 dwelling units per acre are in RM40 are shown as red on the slide because that's something that's new and different for Capitola. Um, another thing that um, we've proposed that would be new and different is um, allowing a, um, a little additional height for a roof element above um, the 30 feet or the 35 feet um, in order to accommodate um, three stories with um, a more visually interesting roof form and um, to incentivize pitched roofs and to try to avoid um, flat roofs um, in new development uh, that seek to build three stories. So that's what that is all about. Um, another thing that we have looked at is the building coverage. So I mentioned previously that building coverage is a standard um, of the percentage of the lot that's occupied by a building. And currently in all of the RM zoning districts, it's 40%. And once you start getting up to a density of 12 and 20 dwelling units per acre or more, that starts to become a constraint and makes uh, achieving those densities infeasible. And so for that reason, in the RM20, as well as the RM30 or an RM40, we've proposed a higher building coverage standard than what currently exists. And then the last standard to highlight um, that's new and different is the rear setback. Um, so um, we've proposed a 10 foot rear setback um, with 20 feet if it's abutting an RN, R1 zone in order to accommodate um, infill multifamily housing types that may occupy more of the rear of the lot in order to allow for open space on the site that's more appropriate for that style of development. So that's something that is new and different as well. Okay, so the last thing I'll say before uh, ending this part of the presentation is that um, in addition to the proposed standards that were just on the screen, there are a lot of other standards in the zoning code that development has to comply with. Um, and um, it includes um, other provisions in the zoning code, whether it's landscaping or open space. It also includes the recently adopted objective standards for multifamily and mixed use residential development. So any residential, multifamily residential project um, that is proposed in Capitola, no matter um, where it is, needs to comply with these standards. And these standards address a range of important um, topics related to building and site design um, listed on the screen. And one of the things that these standards does is um, address the massing and the height and the scale of new multifamily buildings that are located adjacent to existing single family residential uses and requires a lower height and massing that shift back away from the property line uh, in order to provide for a more compatible scale of development relative to that adjacent residential development. So I think it is important to note that in addition to the development standards about height and building coverage um, that I talked about previously, there's a whole suite of other standards that development would need to comply with, in particular, these recently adopted objective standards for multifamily development. Okay, so, um, yes. Um, I, nope, this is oh. great, the next slide. I think we'll go, I'd like to just jump in at this point for this slide. And this is just revisiting that we've got two options going forward, um, either with, with these changes to the RM as we get feedback tonight that this could come back um, at our next meeting with revisions or because this is not part of the 2024 requirements for our housing element, we could spend more time on this. There's definitely public interest and bring this forward in 2025. So if we were to do that, we would do new public noticing and um, make updates reflective of the meeting tonight and then um, send out notices for a second uh, public work session in 2025. I did wanna let everyone know in the room that we've opened up our overflow room 
Um, the community room in the back is open. We've got a TV in there and speakers. If you'd like to be a little more comfortable, I know it's kind of packed in here and a little warm. So that's now available with extra seating. So we'll go on to the next slide. Um, All right, so our uh, suggestion to the Planning Commission is um, to uh, receive public comment uh, on the RM zones in uh, specifically, uh, and then um, to bring it back to the commission and to provide uh, staff feedback on the draft zoning map amendments and development standards, as well as um, the timing of this portion of the zoning code amendment. So with that, I'll conclude staff presentation. Thank you very much. Um, with that, we're going to bring it to commission questions. Do we have any questions? Uh, I have a couple questions. If I don't mind. Um, first of all, thank you for everybody coming out this evening. Um, I think, uh, like many of the other commissioners, we've received a lot of feedback, which is appreciated. And um, I pulled together some questions that I've been asked. And if, um, if you don't mind me just asking them, um, uh, out loud, Katie, and maybe we could go through that process of um, helping maybe some background to how we got here today. So, um, and these are questions that I've just kind of pulled together out of what I've been asked. And um, so, when, uh, the first question um, can you um, maybe kind of step back and tell us how we got to the 1336 number that is being um, in, uh, required by the housing? Uh, element that we've gone through that process and how we got to that point. Yes. Um, so the 1,336 number, which we're all very familiar with now, is is our regional housing needs allocation. And a couple years back, about three years back, the, the state assigned our region, which is comprised of Monterey County and Santa Cruz County, um, they assigned us 33,000 units. And then through the regional planning process with AMBAG, our regional planning, um, we they work through, we figure out a, a formula in which to distribute, distribute the units. So through that process of divvying up the 33,000 units, Capitola was assigned 1,336. And I guess, um, so the follow-up to that when I talk to people about that, is what happens if Capitola didn't comply with that mandate? So if we were not to comply, we would, um, there's actually some financial implications that would happen to the city. As a small city um, with a limited budget, we depend heavily on grant funding from for transportation um, and planning projects. So if we were not to be compliant with our, with the housing element, we would be subject to not only not being able to get grant funding, um, but also you also can lose local controls. So the state can uh, take over our local controls, such as like the planning commission's function to review projects. Um, there's They can require mandatory compliance that we come into compliance with 120 days and it, it's a um, an action of the courts. And then also, when you start to, we can be sued by um, nonprofits or other in, uh, concerned citizens that um, think we're not, that because we're not in compliance with the state law. And then also, with getting sued, you rack up fees and expenses. So there's really um, a, a couple cities have tried that route, have been very unsuccessful. It's very costly. Um, and so that's. Uh, the builder's remedy, can they lay that on us if we're not on track to put the so, six in or? Yeah, when, when we're substantially, if we're not in substantial compliance with our housing, with, with the requirement for a certified housing element, um, builder's remedy is a term that I'll um, explain. So builder's remedy is when you're not in compliance, a developer can come in, and as long as it's an affordable housing project, and I think it has to have 20% affordable units within it, they can come in and they almost have a, almost a buy right process. Um, the city would have a really hard time turning down a project. So your typical oversights that are, uh, we talked about our development standards tonight in our zoning code, um, it, 
they could ask for a lot more than they can typically do under the code. So you really, when you don't have a compliant, or a certified housing element, you really put your city at risk for projects that typically would not be approved by the Planning Commission and are very hard to deny. I think you kind of answered it. Um, there are some cities that are not complying with that now, and that just turns into a large legal battle, battling the city directly to the state. Is that correct? That's correct. It becomes very expensive, and it becomes a, a large legal battle. And then um, I know there is a, for instance, that some of us might have read about in the newspaper up in Portola Valley. They, can, can we go over that process on how they had a housing element, but then it was like uncertified? Is that a technical term? Or yeah. Is it certified? Sorry. So Portola Valley, they, um, they got a certified housing element, I want to say, in January of this year. And then you're required um, by February 15th every year to submit to the state how you're in compliance with your housing element. So every year we submit our, our update on how Capitola is in compliance with the housing element. Portola Valley um, did not, they'd been working on their housing element, but they weren't implementing at the same time. So once they got to that reporting date, they were out they were then out of compliance because they hadn't taken the steps they had to do in that first year. And this is our first year, 2024, so that's why we're here tonight working on these things. Um, so they weren't in compliance for their first year of reporting because they hadn't implemented the items they said they would implement in their first year. So they were in compliance for about a month and a half. And then once they re did their reporting to the state, they were then decertified. Thank, and I, oh, sorry, I have a couple more. Um, so, um, what um, I guess going forward, so I think a little bit of the background is taken care of, but going forward, what were the total number of properties identified then in this RM uh, rezoning process that you looked at from, this, from the city standpoint at this time? Yes, yeah, so uh, for the RM rezoning, um, we're lucky. We have a lot of multifamily properties in Capitola and a great diversity of a housing stock in Capitola. Um, with that comes a lot of noticing. So I would say staff put um, a solid, I think, three and a half days into the public noticing that came along with this meeting. There were close to 2,000 green cards sent out to property owners anyone within 300 feet of a, a rezone. Also, um, the, there was an advertisement placed in the newspaper and um, notices were placed along the blocks where, where there was public, where there was going to be changes to zoning. And it, it and it's, an, so that, that's, so it, it was a, a really big effort and I would say all in all, it was about three and a half days of staff time to get all of that out, so. And, and we did it early. Um, it wasn't required this round. It's typically required by law just to put something in the newspaper as well as to post the sites. And that's 10 days before taking action um, at the direction of Planning Commission to knowing that this would be a topic that the public would be interested in. Um, we noticed early to make sure that we could have the public engaged in the beginning of this process to make sure it's reflective of our community. And just to highlight the timeline uh, of when the RM has to be reviewed um, and come into compliance for the housing home is, what's the latest time frame? It needs to, we, we need to have um, amendments in place by December of 2025. Okay, thank you. Um, and I think I just have one more. Um, oh, just, um, could you, um, and I think you touched on it, and so did Ben, but just the overall process that, the city used to try to identify some of the these areas. You know, did you look at location, transportation, um, in, impacts, and stuff like that when we tried to identify some of these? Yeah. For overall, um, we look at transportation corridors has been a main focus. Um, you know, where metro is located and where people can get on public transportation. Um, also, proximity to jobs is important. Um, Capitola is not a very large city, so luckily most things are within walking distance. But a lot of the, um, the for the housing element, many of the sites are on our 
commercial corridors where it really makes sense to go to mixed use. We already have transportation corridors in place. Um, and we, other, our assets of our environmentally sensitive habitat areas are areas that we don't want to have increased density on. We also do not want to have increased density along our geological hazards along the bluffs. Um, in our areas like the village that are really constrained by the, um, the road, the road widths and parking and all of that, um, that's an area. And we've got a lot of historic resources there as well. So um, throughout the housing element update, there was a desire by a lot of residents and the planning commission and the city council to really distribute um, housing throughout Capitola. We're also um, within this round of the housing element, there's requirements around Fair Housing Act and making more opportunities in all neighborhoods for all people. So that's been another focus as well. So really spreading the density out um, throughout the city. That's all I had, thank you. Thank you. Do you have any other questions from mission? No? Uh, I can't remember. Um, are we proposing any changes to 17.82, the objective standards? I don't think we are, right? Are we, are we proposing any, making any change while we're doing the, the maps and all that? Are we also changing the objective standards? No. Right, so we're sticking with that code was redone last year or two years ago, something like that? Last year. Yeah. Last year, okay. Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay, so a um, few points I'd like to make before we open the public hearing. Um, in Capitola, we have a long tradition of respecting everyone's point of view and a right to express their perspective at city council or at a city council meeting. When members of the audience boo or cheer for those whose opinions they oppose or support, it can become intimidating for some to speak. But I also recognize that everyone here in the room will speak to in the room will speak tonight and would prefer to express their support for others who do not choose to speak. So in order to make sure we maintain an environment that fosters inclusion, if you support something someone says, please raise your hand. <laughs> so, uh, before we get started, can everyone who wishes to speak tonight raise their hand? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Um, given the number of people, people who plan to speak, we'd limit everyone's uh, time to about two minutes. And uh, to give everybody a chance to, to hear everybody out. And finally, I'm asking the city clerk to help us stick to the time limits. To, so please do limit your comments to two minutes and respect the clerk if, she tell, if he tells you your time comment, to comment is over. Understood? Okay, um, with that, we're gonna open the public hearing. Oh yes, thank you. And when you when you approach the podium, please sign in and and make sure your microphone is on and to speak directly into the microphone pad. Within two inches usually is preferable because you can't hear it after. Can you hear me? Oh. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Sorry. Just one more second. Well, take your time. Anybody who'd like to speak, please make a single file line on the left hand side, my left of the room. Um, and please, again, no cheering, booing. Um, if you support something, yeah, you got it. There you go. <laughs> Thank you very much for everybody's participation. This is a good public process. And um, if we could please limit the side conversations to, I mean, non-audible whispers because we'd like to maintain respect to the person speaking at each point. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> My name is Keith Cahalan. I've been a resident for 35 years and I happen to be in the electronic security industry and uh, the reason that's relevant is um, I sell to companies like Midpen and other apartment complexes because of people's concern over security. So I've been tracking this fairly um, intensively for the last 10 years. Um, I want to thank Jerry very, very much for providing the background that was not provided on how we got to this point and we're stepping back looking at the forest and not the trees. Um, the only thing I think I'd make, and it, it really goes back to the more the city council and the, and the city administration, is um, 
I want to state that I think the 1336 number or whatever it is is unreasonable, and I think that we should have some appeal process, and I'll give you some numbers. Uh, Capitola has a population of 10,000, so that represents a 13% increase for us. Santa Cruz, with their uh, 61,000 population, were only assigned 6,000 new units. The city of San Francisco, with their close to 800,000 population, was up last year was only assigned a little about 8,250 new units, about one tenth of one percent. So I'd like to know how in the world Capitola, whoever represented us on the uh, the local board, didn't do a very good job. I'll hate to put somebody down, but um, but the bottom line is my main point is understand we'll have to do some of this because there'll be some penalties otherwise. Um, but I think that we need to step back and look at why Capitola has been stepped on so much and penalized for our requirements versus other cities across the state. Because I don't know anybody else that has a 13% increase in their housing requirement. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for retaining applause. <laughs> Hands in the air for support. Thank you. Please sign in and speak into the microphone. Oh, uh, there's no pen. Oh. But everyone knows who I am let's not pretend you don't uh, actually <laughs> so uh, I would like to talk about that gentleman's question actually it was a great question uh, so who did represent us the president of AMBAG the group that actually assigned us this number of units and it is an absurdly high number of units no other city was assigned a number of units the president of AMBAG at the time was mayor Kristen Brown our mayor so she was the one in charge of the group that assigned us these units. Staff can confirm this. Uh, on top of that, I would like to talk about builder's remedy. So we're on our 10th housing element. Most cities did it in two or three. Scotts Valley did it in one, I think. Uh, doesn't really matter. The point is 10 is an absurdly high number. We are way into builder's remedy. Builder's remedy will allow any developer who wants to build 20% affordable, and really that gets knocked down to like 13%, but any builder to build all along the rail line as tall as they want and we cannot stop them until our housing element is passed and we're already there guys this could happen tomorrow uh and on top of that now nah, you know that's it thanks guys <laughs> thank you don't hit the button yet <laughs> Oh, oh, okay. Good idea. Thank you very much, sir. He's taking charge. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you'll be good boy. Okay, ready? Okay, uh, hello. Now, my name is Charles Thomas, and our family has lived at 516 Park Avenue for more than 51 years. I'm here to address the possibility of increasing the number of units allowed on the 600 Park Avenue property. Over the years, I've worked with the city on the Finance Committee, the Ad Hoc Hiring Committee, the Risman Committee, and other advisory positions. My wife was the Planning Commissioner. So I feel that I have a pretty good idea over the 51 years of how things work. Our property is contiguous to the 600 Park Avenue apartments. Over the years, I've had made many friends of some of the occupants who actually live in the property. It seems to me that the only real low income housing left around here is the 600 apartments. I keep reading how Santa Cruz has lost track of how many low income units are actually being built in their city. What the developers call low income is now not affordable for middle class income. So why not take a look at the property next to Bay Avenue, for example, the off ramp? which I don't see uh, as designated. Um, I remember when the city talked about the housing there, what happened? They're not displacing people, they're not disrupting the lives of so many people. So what are we gonna do with all the residents of the 600 Park Avenue development if indeed the developer comes in and wants to develop? Um, this is my main concern, along with the traffic situation, which is a real problem there anyway. So I would hope that, um, that the representatives of Capitola community are not on the some developer who is thinking about, I should, let me repeat that. So my hopes are that you are here to represent our local community and not some developer who I don't think can really say that they are here to enhance the village of Capitola. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Good. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Hello. I just want to ask one quick question before I start. How many of you have actually gone out to the 600 Park Avenue site? Thank you. And you can appreciate how rare it is in Capitola. My name is Dan Benvenuti. I have a home at 105 Wesley Street. I've lived there for the past 40 years. 600 Park Avenue apartments are directly behind my home. Since becoming aware 11 days ago of the rezoning of multiple areas to Capitola, I've been very busy trying to educate myself on the issue. I hope the commission realizes that the decisions before them have an everlasting impact on the citizens of our community. That being said, I hope that more time can be made available that the public can educate themselves and better express their concerns. These are my concerns. I received information that the property was on the market several months ago. The listing included a possible representation of a new development, which you all have, since then, the property is sold to a large developer. According to the draft zoning code, your draft zoning code, uh, approximately 300 pages, chapter 17.05, proposed effect section, item number one states, Prever preserve and enhance Capitola, small town feel, coastal village charm. It doesn't do that. Number two, ensure that all development exists high quality design that supports a unique sense of space. Doesn't do that either. And finally, number three, protect and enhance the quality of life in residential neighborhoods. 600 Park Avenue is right in the middle of a residential neighborhood, except for a small portion in the back. The conceptual renditions which I have included obviously do not adhere to your purpose and effect section. In January 14, 2010, the Coastal Commission held a hearing on one of the topics was the request by the City of Capitola to, to amend the LCP. Well, can I have more time? We really shouldn't. We have a lot. Okay. Out well, there. you have all this. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Capitola, for showing up. Thank okay. You. And show up next time. Thank you very much. Hi, Cheryl Pernard, uh, 525 Pilgrim Drive. I have some questions for you, just for clarification, if I can. So these, uh, during public comment, it's typically, it, it's to address the planning commission and express your concerns. We really don't do back and forth question and answers during public comment. Okay, so I'll just ask and maybe someone can answer for me. So these existing non-conformity multifamily examples, first, my first question is, how was it possible that these units were able to build more on the land than what was required? That's my first question. The second question is, once it is redesignated, can we use those extra units that were built when they should not have been built towards the 1,000 whatever number that we have there? And the third question that I have is, how can we ensure that that's not going to happen to these new buildings that are wanting that are you're wanting to create and build no one can answer that we we can take we yes oh. we, we're, we've written the questions down and we've you've submitted questions and we can't have a dialogue even is that but i appreciate all the comments thank you we i know where they're answered where will i get that information okay thank you Thank you. I can give my minute to the gentleman. We, we, no. <laughs> can I start? <laughs> Bye. May I wait for my time to start until they have one? Good evening. My name is Samantha Farron, and I'm a homeowner here in uh, Capitola. I would like staff to address this issue after my comment is complete. We are homeowners of the parcels of the real property that the proposed zoning map amendment, specifically section five of said map, said map amendment, which is attached as exhibit A to my letter, 
This letter is in opposition to the proposed rezoning pertaining specifically to Section 5 only of said map. We understand that the state of California has tasked each city and county within the state with expanding and rezoning areas within their respective jurisdictions to increase density under the California Housing Opportunity and More Efficiency Home Act. We have reviewed the proposed map amendments that were published on your website. We would like to draw the Planning Commission's attention to Section 5 of the, matched, of the map attached as Exhibit A versus Sections 1 through 4 of the same map. If you flip to that map, you will see sections one, two, three, and four of the Northeast area map currently are comprised of multi-story condos. These sections one through four do not abut single family residences or residences at all for that matter. On one side of the parcel of this section one through four is Balboa Avenue and on the other side is Park Avenue. Section five is currently comprised of two duplexes and a fourplex that are one and two stories respectively. These parcels that abut Section 5 are all single-family residences and that and one or two stories. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to flip to the second page of my letter. In sum, Section 5 is an inland, an island of proposed rezoning that deviates extraordinarily from the standard in the neighborhood. All the people that signed this request that the Planning Commission do the following. For Section 5, only adopt the current density and remove the proposed increased density to 30 dwelling units. If we continue allowing development to exceed the dwelling units per acre allotted, what's to say that if this is adopted, we won't be here again in the future increasing density further? Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, my name is Julie Madrona, and I um, am considering what is the purpose of this housing increase, whether it's more housing or more affordable housing, and will it truly be, provide more affordable housing? I live at 825 Balboa, one of the um, high-density apartments out of compliance. My 22-year-old and her husband live in a small Basic one bedroom at 600 Park Avenue. It was the most affordable place that they could find for their first home together. They both work full time entry level jobs at local businesses. And a year ago, the ratio for the rent on my daughter's one bedroom apartment to their net income was 39%. At the beginning of this year, the rent, in, um, the rent on these one bedroom units increased 22%. They were told it was to look more appealing to the prospective buyers. They are now paying 47%, nearly half of their take home income from their full time jobs to live at 600 Park Avenue, which is not a sustainable financial situation in the long term and they hope to start a family at some point. Altogether, the property owner is collecting over 200,000 per month in rent on the 80 units at 600 Park Avenue. If my neighbors pay the same, paid the same rent as we did, the, that property owner is collecting around 80,000 a month for that one complex of about 24 units. My question is if, is, if the purpose of this rezoning proposal is more affordable housing, Will the rent cost for residents at 600 Park Avenue go down proportionately when they are sharing the same property between, say, 270 households instead of 80 households? More of a rhetorical question, but I want to put it out there. Thank you. Thank you. Looks like it's on. Okay, hi. Uh, my name is Mary Margulies, and I uh, live in one of the houses that is directly affected by the proposed rezoning of 600 Park Ave. I'd like to talk about how I feel, but I also want to echo the person who just went. Um, what about the people that are living there right now? It is 79 new units. From my backyard, I hear people of different languages speaking speaking different languages. I hear them calling their kids in for dinner. I hear babies laughing. I hear people watching TV laughing. It is a beautiful place for, for those residents. Now, I know she just commented on the rent, but it is shared with, with 79. You are proposing the highest increase out of anywhere else in the zone. It is 2.67 times as much, 267 times as many people. That is what you're proposing. 
you're going from a 15 to a 40. I did the math. It's what I do. We are currently at about 9,000 9, uh, 9, people living in Capitola. That puts us at 5,600 people per square mile. It's one of the highest densities in California. When do we say this is enough? When do we say, okay, Monterey, okay, Santa Cruz, you have some farmland, maybe we can use it. Maybe we join forces and say, we cannot do all those units. We'll try our best, but why don't we work together with our neighbors instead of them just telling us how much we should do. We need to push back. We need to do that. Just because we're asked to do something doesn't mean we have to do it exactly how they ask. Thank you. Hi, Mike Margulies, husband of Mary. Um, so we've been here 25 years. This is our second time through the process. Um, actually, I want to start by saying I agree with everything that's been said. It's a completely broken process. Last time around, it was the same story. State's mandating it. There's nothing we can do. We're going to get sued. We're going to be penalized. Um, that may be currently true under the given restrictions. So what we're looking for is the council to start figuring out a way to push back working with other small communities or even large communities that have to be just as frustrated uh, with the process as it is. Right? We can't fight back alone, obviously. We have to start aligning with other communities and figuring out how to push back on this process. I'm going to a fair amount of time. Um, so I guess I will also say that um, uh, building 1,300 units or 1,300 plus will have massive impact on our community, but zero impact on the overall bigger problem of housing, right? There's a better way, for sure. As Mary pointed out, there's a lot of land in Santa Cruz County. Um, not much available here in the you know, little 1.6 square mile is kept all. So the council needs to start figuring out a way to aligning with other um, communities, figuring out how to start pushing back on the state and getting this changed. And I guess as a community, we should start working on that too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Eric Fawcett. I live on uh, 44th Avenue here in Capitola, and I have more of a question than a comment, which is about the quality of life here in Capitola. When I first moved into my home 40 years ago, I could see <clears throat> the Milky Way in the sky. Um, recently, neighbors across the street have put in lighting that is so intense that I can no longer see the sky through the glare of the lighting across the street. That lighting lights up my back fence at 196 feet from the light to my back fence. I'm wondering about if Capitola has any requirements or restrictions on exterior lighting in our community, that what I'm seeing is I'm being blinded in my bedrooms by the lights across the street. Is there a regulation for external lighting? And if not, why not? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Oliver Meinke. I live at 1836 46 Avenue. Our family has been there for 25 years. We live in this northwest area, which is now full of a dark brown blob of uh, uh, large increases in density. So it goes from 12 to 30, 10 to 20, 14 to 30. So it's a doubling, sometimes almost tripling of the density of dwelling units. When you walk there in the evening after five, the streets are full of cars that are parked. I don't know where triple or double the amount of cars are supposed to go. We know that in Capitola Gardens, many people opt for not buying or paying the extra rent, you know, for buying a parking space, but rather parking on the streets. So I'm not sure how that is supposed to work. And on a minor scale, I'm, it's very pleasant to live there with all the trees. I wonder whether 
So it's going to impact the trees which are on the, along these streets. And then, I don't know, but uh, we, we know that Sokal water is already strained with its water resources. We get notices right from the, uh, from the utility. So I wonder whether doubling or tripling the amount of people will put more strain on that, will it maybe you know, raise the, uh, the, the fees that we have to pay to the water utility. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Brenda Torres. I live at 705 Bay Avenue, so just right up the street. I live across the street from the senior housing unit, which you're proposing to increase to 40 units per acre, which would be an extreme hit. Bay Avenue is difficult to get down and to pull out my car is quite difficult just with the traffic as it is now. With the increase in all the multiple home units that you've got in your paperwork here, I, there's no point in having a car. I can't get it out. There's also no place to park. I have are required by the city to put in spots for two parking on my property, which I did to be in compliance, and yet the units across the street from me have four to five cars that are now parking on my side of the street. So my concern is parking and increased density of traffic, which you already know it's a problem crossing the street. It's unsafe. So bringing in this many more cars on top of people is going to be a huge problem. That's not why I moved here. So please consider that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the respectful hands. Hi, my name is George Dunlap. Um, I have the same concerns as we're hearing all throughout the night, but I have very specific concerns as it relates to the numbering of the RM units, the doubling specifically. When I look at this flyer, and it appears to be to address the existing non-conformity of other buildings. So we're gonna set numbers to bring non-conforming buildings into alliance doesn't make sense. I see or hear nothing about environmental constraints. I've heard nothing that justifies these numbers. I've heard nothing except trying to make Capitola right in the zones that would justify this. I do not understand. So again, addressing existing non-conforming multifamily units doesn't make sense to me. These numbers are arbitrary. Hi, I'm Linda Barnes. I live on Clare Street, which is a nightmare traffic-wise most of the time, and I don't see traffic addressed in any of this. And I heard you say that 41st is a transportation zone. That's why you're looking at that. Well, I don't see that being addressed as road work being done there. So it's just going to be worse, not better. So this will be highly controversial, but I don't know why high-density developments are being looked at. Let's think about the single family homes. Start rezoning them multifamily. Duplex, fourplex, start looking at that. Why are we getting penalized? Okay. And also, we love our greenery, big trees, oaks, cedars. They go down, these big houses come in, we get maybe a small grape myrtle. So thank you very much. Thank you. My name's Robin Peake. I live at 920 Capitol Avenue. I moved into that park when it was owned by a mobile home park owner. The owners of that park converted that park to an owner park. That apartment that is behind us, that you say that we're going to have character now. We have plenty of character. The, the way that this has been constructed is formulaic. There is no creativity in this at all, and there's no consideration for those people that live in that apartment that have green space for their children, and there's no consideration, excuse me, I'm a terrible public speaker, there's no consideration for the people that live in the park behind it. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jennifer. I live on 46th Avenue. Thank you so much for letting me speak to you today. I appreciate that very much. Um, I live directly across from the Capitol Gardens. Apartments. We lived there for more than 50 years, and so we've seen a lot of changes, but not so many, uh, because it's a fairly low-density um, housing area, right, or complex right there at 10 units, um, 20, 20, 
sorry, 10 dwelling units per acre, um, which it does not meet that. It, not, as you're right, it's 12 units um, per acre, and it's now proposed at a 30 unit per acre um, change. So there's huge changes between uh, meeting something and then going way overboard to, to 30. Um, I realize we're in the housing element um, as a buildable space, but and I was I, I really appreciated the comment that was saying that you looked at the whole community or the area because um, if you look at our area, we've got five uh, on our street alone. We've got five apartment complexes, one condominium complex, and now it's going way up. And everything is proposed at 30 units per acre. It makes um, me a little nervous considering that we are enticing people to build, and then in order to entice them to build, if they want to build, we have to say, well, you know, you don't have enough parking, but we just have to give it to you anyway. So it makes me a little concerned how that we're, we're kind, of, kind of playing a dance that I don't think that we're going to win, and I hope that we do. Um, so I guess my concern or today is just to, um, just to ask you to reconsider some of those high-end zoning, zoning um, numbers um, changes in the high density areas, which I guess I was listening to everybody sounds like we're all high density. <laughs> but um, so just that would be my consideration. And just to ask you, just if you can do that, that'd be much appreciated to me and my family. Thank you. Hi, my name is Heather Carey. I live at 1005 Balboa, which is one of the duplexes that has been slated to potentially rezone. Um, first and foremost, I believe Jerry asked a question which was not answered. It was sidestepped, and I would like to eventually get to know the answer to that, which is how many residential units are rezoned to increase capacity size in Capitola, um, specifically, you know, uh, how many that may need to be torn down and built with higher capacity. And I'm curious. One, that neighborhood already has massive issues with traffic and with people speeding through it, trying to cut through and avoid Park Avenue, coming down Kennedy um, to avoid Highway 1. So if you're proposing all of these new units and adding traffic, what are you going to do to accommodate those traffic issues? Because we've already got some very bad ones. Another thing I would like to know is, have you taken into consideration not only just those on the affected side of Balboa, but also those in 600 Park Avenue? How many of us have children that you would be displacing? This is an already lean market, so why aren't we looking for a solution where we're not having to displace members of the community? Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, my name is Tessa Tupman. I live at, live at 730 Orchid Avenue, um, pretty close to where um, you guys are thinking about, or not you guys, people are thinking about building at 600 Park Avenue. I'm going to read this because I get really nervous when I talk in front of people like this. So um, I'd like to just say the location chosen for the proposed zoning change from R10 to R40 at 600 Park Avenue is not suitable. This type of project requires transparency so that the surrounding community can have input because this change will directly impact the skyline, traffic, parking, privacy, and safety of its neighbors. The traffic in Capitola is absolutely terrible in changing the zoning of 609 Park Avenue will directly impact the traffic in our community because it quadruples the amount of housing. Please also take into consideration how changing the zoning at 600 Park Avenue will affect the middle school students at New Brighton Middle School. There's a school right behind there. This is going to be right on top of it. There's going to be a lot more people. Um, it's adding another element that, that I don't think is right for that area, in my opinion. Um, this just isn't the right location for high density housing in Capitola. Um, my hope is that the Planning Commission takes the time necessary to educate themselves and work with our community to find a better solution. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, everyone, for your comments. Um, do we have any more? Anybody else you'd like to speak? My name's Ari Lacine. I live at 905 Capitola Avenue. And um, I just have a question. I, I'm just not clear how many units could be in the mall property, the, what seems to me like the best location for multi-use, multi-family, multi-res, you know, for what we have, have to do or what, you know. So my question is, how many units could we have there? Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, Dave Tucci. I live on Francesco Circle. I've been a homeowner here for 27 years. I've seen a huge increase in traffic along Claire's and Wharf Road in recent years. And uh, I just want the Planning Commission to consider if you build it, they will come and they will bring their cars. <laughs> um, you know, you, you approved a, 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 um, a property across the street from um, the AAA, and it's like 36 units and 27 parking spaces. You know, people just drive around in circles until they find a parking space. They're not going to give up their cars. Um, I'm from New York. I've lived in San Francisco, two cities with great transportation and terrible parking. And people don't give up their cars. They just drive around the neighborhood until they find a parking space or they block somebody's driveway or they park illegally because you need to park your car. So if you're going to if you're going to approve housing, approve enough parking for the housing, which is probably two cars, realistically two cars per household. Anything else you, you dream in? Because pe people aren't aren't going to give up their cars. Thank you. Thank you. Any Anybody else like to opportunity to speak? Okay, hearing none. I'm going to close the public hearing and bring it back for commission deliberation. Well, I can answer one of your questions. Um, on the mall, we're proposing in the current version of the uh, housing element yet to be approved by the state, but will be submitted in a week or two, I think, mm -hmm. final approval. 61% uh, of the 1336 number is what we're proposing to do at the mall, which is uh, absolute numbers, eight, 813 units. And Chair, if you'd like, I could respond to a few of the questions that were asked. Just please, that would be appreciated. Okay. Um, so one question was about the non-conforming and how were they able to build more than allowed? And... Um, there's many sites, as I mentioned earlier, that are over the non that are non-conforming and are beyond the density limits, and that's a, a mix of properties being annexed into the city, as well as properties being developed under old codes. Um, the The question was then asked: Can they be used towards our arena? The that gap between what was what's allowed under the density and the, the additional. Unfortunately not, the arena really has to be all new. Um, and it has to be, um, if it has to be the amount of, of new units. So if a, if, if a location was um, demolished and had five units on it, and the developer came in and built 10, we would only get credit for five units because you're required to build back what was on site as well as uh, the, the only the new units, the gross um, count. So, and then, how, and then how can we assure this is not done? Um, currently, there's been a lot of updates to state law. We follow the state law in terms of our zoning code and following the density limits. However, I will say, um, I can't assure you that this will never be done because the state, under state law, there's the state density 
bonus law in which a developer can come in and if they produce a certain amount of affordable housing, they can go beyond our density limits. So, um, other questions that yeah, came sorry. up were about lighting. Katie, I'm sorry, on that last comment you had, can you take that a little bit more in detail to explain what that really means? Like, you know, a hypothetical? Sure. Um, so, a hypothetical of state density law. So, under that scenario of a developer coming in and building 10 units, if uh, if the a project came in and it was 100% affordable, under state density law, the developer has the right to waive three up to three provisions of our zoning code. So typically we see them ask for um, to waivers for the height because you need additional height to fit additional units as well as parking um, and then typically setbacks. So. And a waiver in parking would look like? What we're, what we're seeing these days when we have a 100% affordable development come in is typically just a little over one space per unit, so. And so the project that was mentioned before across from the AAA on Half Avenue, that was 100% affordable, correct? 100% affordable, 36 units. And so, um, I don't know if you can re recollect, but so like on the parking requirements there, they were able to ask, that was one of their conditions were to not have parking standards, is that correct? They, they yes, that they asked to decrease the parking standards on site. And then height also? Was there a height issue with them too? And then they asked for They asked for an exception to height. I think height in that zone is 30, and they asked for 36 feet. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, comments on quality of life, life and lighting. We do have restrictions on lighting, and we'd be happy to process a um, if, if there's an issue there, we're happy to follow up with you in the planning department. Um, so another question came in about why the RM zone, why aren't we looking at the R1, the single family? And actually we are looking at the R1. So we've had, as we stated, we have had, I think this is our sixth work session on the housing element update. And many of the, the large focus has been on um, the missing middle housing and ADUs um, densifying our single family neighborhoods. So there's been a lot of um, discussion on allowing duplexes in certain areas in the single family zoning districts. So we are considering the R1 and I would say the, the there's two state laws that are really pushing the R1 efforts, one being SB9 in which any single family property owner is allowed to subdivide their lot into two currently, and they can have up to two units on each lot. So every single family home, every single family parcel in the city of Capitola could be subdivided and in total have four units. So that that's existing state law. And then also there's um, under existing state law, every single family property can have one accessory dwelling unit as well as one junior accessory dwelling unit. So there's two two uh, paths forward through state law, which we just review as an, typically administrative permits as required by state law for single family. So single family is definitely, it's actually one of the areas we're seeing the greatest increase um, in housing production with the ADUs. Um, and then there was a question about along Balboa and how many residential units are rezoned to tear down or allow more density. So there's one one focus, um, I, I hear a lot of concern of what happens to the residents that live in these in these units. If they're affordable units under the state law, they're required to uh, bring back the same amount of affordable units. And there is consideration for the people that live in the units. So if we had a developer come in to do a uh, density bonus application, um, or if they were going to redevelop one of the sites that's uh, in our site's inventory, they would have to do their own like inventory of the people that live there and understand their income levels and then also um, provide housing. So those homes need to be replaced as well as the additional affordable housing provided. So there are protections put in place under state law for um, reintroducing those houses. Um, 
And then the mall answer was question was an, the mall question was answered. So I think that gets through all the questions this evening. I think there was one other question, Katie, that maybe you could elaborate on about the environmental impact. On, on sometimes these projects can ask for um, exemption for that standpoint too, correct? So for environmental impacts, um, that's something we have looked at in this update, and we are trying not to put any additional density near our. Um, environmentally sensitive habitat areas, our geological setbacks, our geological hazards, um, that, has been, that has been taken into consideration under the current standards. Uh, there was also a question about water, which I asked at the beginning of all this. And my recollection was Soquel Creek, the auto water provider are planning on increasing the water supply over the next five years by about 30-ish percent in their current plan if they get it funded. And I don't, I don't, I haven't kept track if they're getting funding or not. But that 30 percent would, would should be able to cover us if we have to do all 13, 36 units. Sure, I'll start. Um, so when all of this started way back when and this, these arena numbers first, first came across our desks, I mean, it was clear that our position based on the general plan, based on all the documentation we had, that Capitola was built out. It was been a population of $10,000 for 10,000 population for decades and decades, and all the issues that were brought up with regards to parking and traffic, as well as water and some other things, were the reason why we were happy with the way things were. But the state has come in and said, statewide, we need more housing. And I have embraced that. And so I have been enthusiastically looking at the opportunities as they've been presented by staff and the consultants where we can have additional housing. Granted, it's gonna be painful, but the, there's a lot of people who wanna live in Capitola. They don't wanna live in farmland. They wanna live here. And so the demand is here. Um, but in general, our approach has been, and the state's approach has been to try to concentrate this housing near mass transit. Now we really don't have mass transit, but we, at least we have buses and proximity to Highway 1 near jobs, we have some of those, and near shopping. And then in addition to that, they have a transition between residential zones and high density zones so that it's not a, an abrupt, abrupt change. So when I look at the residential zones that we're talking, RM zones, none of those criteria really apply. And uh, there's reasons to have Take a second look at some of these things, like for example, the 600 Park, which was brought up again and again. Uh, I've been there, I, it's a lovely area. I don't see why it should be changed at all, but that was an opportunity where if there was to be a, a, a new developer and a new development, that that person could come in, not necessarily displace anyone, but to provide housing, both low income and, and what have you. So. We jumped on board and said, yeah, let's put the maximum there and, and a few other places. Now, I don't think we're ready to do that based on now the public input. I, I think we need to have a second look at that. We need to look at this map, particularly in the RM zone. I, I think we're in pretty good con uh, concurrence on the CU zones. But in the RM zones that we're talking about now, I think we have a, we should have, a, there's an opportunity for us to come on forward with some options that we can, we can, you know, choose from. And then when it goes forward to the city council, they can know that we've looked at several options. Uh, and then, and then we can make our case as a planning commission and they can have the final decision. Um, I do believe that we should at a minimum recommend as a planning commission to get the um, parcels that are currently not in compliance into compliance so that so that we should recommend, for example, the 
Northeast Area Zone 5 was identified as, as, a, as a concern that it was going to be built out in this special little island that was all, all by itself. But really all we're doing that, according to your chart, is we're just raising that from the existing 23 dwelling units per acre up to 30, which is, as your footnote says, just legalizes the de existing development density. So I, I think it's okay to go ahead and legalize the uh, and make that change to the housing element or, or implementing our housing element, make those changes right away. But to go much further than that, I, I do think we need um, to get some options and, um, and give us some time to digest some of this community input. Let me see if that's all my notes. It's enough for now. Uh, well, first, I would like to say thank you to all the people who came out here tonight. Um, it's nice to see the citizens of Capitola um, be concerned about their community. Um, I had to chuckle a little bit. Uh, some of you know Charlie Thomas. He's left now. He's sat in the front and said he'd been in Capitola for 51 years and involved in planning. His wife was a planning commissioner and that he understood the rules. And I will tell you, I've been involved in planning Capitola since 1982. Uh, I came here as a housing coordinator, then going to work for the planning department. And um, the rules have changed so dramatically in the last three years that I struggle to keep up with them and understand uh, what we're required to do by the state. Um, I also think it's important to note that we're the planning commission and we work for the city council. So on issues like um, the arena numbers that got accepted by the city, um, you know, those, that's really direction that the city council passes down to us and says, okay, planning commission, we have agreed that Capitola should have this number of new units. You guys first figure out how this is going to happen and then we'll look at your recommendation and we will ultimately decide if this is what's going to happen in town. Um, I'll further say that I, I do think there is a need for some additional housing in Capitola. And having been involved in planning for a lot of years, I think that we have created some artificial barriers that has limited, limited the number of housing units that could be built. And there are some sites in town where the density could be increased and not have a, a negative impact on the community if, as a community, when we do these changes, we start to look at traffic, uh, traffic circulation, where is parking going to be? When we approved the project on Capitola Road, um, uh, I'll just speak for myself, I think a lot of us expressed concern um, that we are required by law to give them the parking exemption. We, they can sue us, they can build, and we have no choice about that. But we talked about to help out the community and help out that neighborhood, that we ought to look at that neighborhood and see if there are things we can do on those existing streets, like go to diagonal parking in some areas. So we're actually creating more parking in our community to try and balance out the impact that we're going to have from these additional housing units coming in. And so far, I haven't seen much of that happen. But I think, you know, when we look at this, we do have to look at our whole community. And I think um, it would be good to delay this for a while, to go through a process where, um, you know, we can educate the community about the, the changes that have taken place. And they are dramatic. Um, they greatly limit the power any local jurisdiction has anymore. Um, uh, nobody else would like to fight some of the regulations than, than I would, but I understand how complicated and expensive that can be and whether or not a little town of Capitola has any hope of being successful at doing that. 
So I think we have the new laws. I think we do need some housing. I think we need to be more thoughtful and think about the consequences of where we put this housing, how it's going to impact parking, how it's going to impact traffic, how it is going to impact our whole community. And, um, you know, there's a lot said about, you know, the, the purpose of this is so that uh, more people can live close to, you know, where they work. Uh, we're going to reduce traffic miles traveled. And I personally don't see a lot of opportunity for a whole lot of new jobs being created in Capitola to accommodate all of the new people who are going to be here. Uh, even in our last letter that we got from Yimby, they acknowledged that there is no, you know, viable transportation system for people to use. Um, I think the word is, they call it quality transportation, which means that uh, a bus or some kind of transportation arrives every 15 minutes, and we, we just don't have that. So there are going to be cars, there are going to be people, there are going to be demands on our school and our community. So we need to take a little more of a holistic approach. And the only way to really do that is have the community involved in this process. That's why it's so nice to see you here. We've had numerous meetings over the summer about this. And I will tell you, there's been no one sitting out there showing you know, much interest in what we were talking about. So it's nice to see you tonight. I think there's a way we can work through this as a community. I think there's a way we can provide more affordable housing, which we need to have right now, uh, even for the people who live here. You heard what people are paying in rents. But I think that needs to be a process that's going to take time, um, shouldn't be rushed, and we should have the opportunity for us all to understand what we're talking about. So that's my comment. Yeah, I would, again, uh, emphasize those comments. Uh, thank you very much for coming. It's, it, we have had a number of meetings uh, about this subject, and they're all been public, and it, that room has been empty. It was really good to see that we're finally getting uh, some public commentary back to us. Uh, and, and it's very useful stuff. I mean, uh, there are certainly issues we've talked about here. Uh, traffic is one. Um, the... Uh, environment and water was water was one I was mostly worried about initially but I think that we're, we'll be okay with that I'd like to address the arena numbers because I, it's it came up a number of times um, we can fight it there's you know we could say 1336 is absurd we're not going to do it and try to fight the state and the city of Newport Beach um, down in Southern California if you've ever been there is pretty much a huge collection of millionaires and they are fighting it and they're losing Culver City fought it, and they lost big time. It cost them a lot of money. We're a tiny, tiny city, and we don't have any, you know, we don't have huge coffers. So I, I think we just, can we hit 1336 in the next eight years? I don't know. I don't have a clue. Can we try? We should at least try to do that. And, um, and if we don't try to do it, we will lose money for roads. Like, we would not have been able to improve Clare Street if we lost the state funding for that project, right? That's an example of the impact of what the state could do to penalize us for not at least trying to hit these, these numbers. So to Peter's point and to Commissioner Weston's point, we're looking at, you know, how can we increase the supply? And, and by the way, the sup we have an undersupply of housing. We can't, we have a lot of people like my kids who can't afford to live here, period. But not by a long shot, Not it's not a small, uh, undersupply. It's a rather substantial one. So, you know, nobody in their 20s and 30s could live here. So now we're going to be a community of old folks' homes, effectively. Um, we don't want that, right? So we need to try to figure out what we can can do that is realistic and does not affect the character of the of the uh, community, which we all love, right? Um, so how do we do that? We need to, you know, we've been working at these maps and looking at how can we rezone to increase the density and make it not um, too impactful on the community. I believe we've, we've looked at the architecture aspects of this as well to like not 
Somebody mentioned our charter about uh, maintaining the character of Capitola. We have been looking at that. And that is one of the reasons why that six foot additional height. So we don't have flat roofs things like, unfortunately that it, it is like, uh, I forget the property number on park, right? Where the, hmm? Yeah, 600 park, well not 600 park, one down beyond it where they've overbuilt, right? That one is. Yeah, 30, 30, above the 30, yes. And, and you looked at, if you look at the uh, property we approved, the low income one on Capitola Road, that we allowed for that, so you couldn't see the HVAC equipment on the top and things like that. So it, it, those items are being considered, and if we're going to attract development, which takes a large amount of capital, we need to look at things like that, which will entice developers to come in and actually build affordable housing for us. And lastly, we put we have put an enormous amount of focus on the mall because that is our only jewel. It's the only pretty much empty area. Uh, you know, we've got huge empty parking lots, right? And we have been working with the mall owner to see what can be developed there, but that is going to be a, you know, we might make it by year eight. It's going to be a long process, right, to, do, to make a huge change to a property like that. So again, thank you very much for your comments. Um, I agree we should work, you know, do more work on this and not rush this thing through. We've got a year or so to, to go on it. Yeah, um, I'll just, uh, echo all the comments and I agree with um, them uh, completely. I think the one thing just to focus on as we look at these numbers, um, it is, you know, handed down to us to plan for this. And I think having the community come out and be a voice and we encourage you to stay involved in this process um, as um, we work through these numbers to see what the best way is. I think uh, Commissioner Esty, you know, highlighted, I think we all have personal um, stories that we can share about not having kids that can live and afford in this area and then they move away and you, you have split families from those standpoints. We have the missing middle, um, you know, just a point of reference, you know, we have one police officer that lives here in Capitola, the rest don't because they can't afford to it. So there's a whole bunch of other impacts. We have low income, we have the missing middle, and there's just so many things. So I think working through these things that um, I always try to say, you know, we don't want people to have to commute to our community, we want people to live in our community. And so with that, um, I like to echo the comments that I've heard and agree with them. Thank you. Thank you. I have, I have one subject to bring up for my fellow commissioners. Uh, Commissioner Wilk um, talked about the existing units that are in town that uh, are non-conforming because either they were built before the city was incorporated, they were built in the county and annexed into the city, or they were built when the zoning regulations were um, uh, different. Uh, I think the Park Avenue apartments got built in the 60s and there was a much higher uh, density that was allowed at that time. And uh, for a community, when we have those kinds of properties in town, it's difficult for the people who own them to get financing to maintain those units, to repair those units, to um, um, you know, keep them up to date. And one of the things as a community is I don't think we want to see the housing uh, like that that we have go away. Um, and I think that's an important part of our housing element and something that we need to, to look at. So I do think that um, it makes a lot of sense for the community and it doesn't have to happen now. It can happen as part of the whole process. But those properties do need to be upzoned so that they conform closely to what was actually built there. Um, and I think we all understand that they're probably not going to go away, but we want them to be maintained. We want the you know, homeowners association or whoever to be able to get financing to do those things that they need to do. So um, in the future, when we consider that, that's one area, you know, I think it's important to look into. And I think in part of that process would be good to have, like, if we go back and create the history on how it got to that point, what was the code at that time, um, which I think would be great to be able to review that and bring people along and why we're making those changes rather than just 
St. Louis bring everything up to the standard today or what it is today? Thank you. Uh, I think this is a really important first step in, um, in our progress from the summer in all of our study sessions, having the community come in and really voice all of the opinions. This is um, going to produce the best product for under, within the state mandates. So having more participation, you know, having, um, trying to cr control and guide this process is um, exactly what needs to happen. So do you have any other comments? I'll, I'll just, um, You want direction from us about what the process is going to be going forward? Would Would you like to summarize it? I, mean, I have a, a clear. I think I have a pretty clear understanding, or I could try to. Well, you you could explain. Just okay. summarize it for us. Okay, so what what I'm hearing is um, this was a first attempt. We'd like to see um, a modification to what was proposed tonight. Relooking at the densities. Um, um, providing more education on some of the non-conformities and why we're there and proposing those. But um, on some of the properties in which we were looking at allowing increased density, we're kind of rethinking some of those properties and finding a more balanced approach, as well as um, let's take more time, maybe have several options to look, look at and I would like to set the expectation that with um, everything that has to be done by the end of this year, I think in terms of the next time you'll be seeing posting in your front yard or your neighbor's front yard, I would say February would be the earliest we get to that. So be looking out for those postings. We'll, we'll um, make sure to post the neighborhoods. There'll be an advertisement in the newspaper, of course. Um, but we'll come back with a new alternative in early 2025. So let me just add another thing. When I was talking about options, where I was coming from from there is that you can look at this, this whole issue from a couple of different extremes. You could say, you know, we were talking about, yeah, we need, we need housing, we need affordable housing, we need the missing middle. Let's really aggressively attack that. And in, in, almost independent of the 1336, where can we provide that housing and, and just be as aggressive as we can and have that like the one extreme option. Then the other extreme option is let's do the minimum we can, we can get away with to, to uh, satisfy the minimum requirements of the state. And so, you know, it's basically two different options. There's the YIMBY option versus the NIMBY option, but not in both, both, uh, satisfying the state requirements. And so that's kind of what I was thinking is that, you know, people do have different, different thoughts on, 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 on housing and, and whatnot, and, and we should be able to reflect that in our options. Yeah, I actually disagree with you in a little as bit. As always. As always. Uh, only because, you know, as I said earlier, I think we do need housing. I think what we want to look at is what is the best way we can do this so we deal with the other issues we have in the community like parking and traffic. Maybe it has to be more than just the housing project being built, but there being some improvements on a particular street where the housing's going in so it can accommodate some of the overflow parking that's going to result from the project being built. I don't want to do, you know, the minimum I can get away with. I want to do something that's going to work for our town. It's going to be a good place for people to live. It is going to provide some housing opportunities for people who need them. And, you know, I, I think if the community and all of us put our heads together, we can come up with some good solutions that are going to work, that are going to provide housing, but also not reduce the quality of life for all of those who already live here dramatically. And we're going to have to be thoughtful in how we do that. But I don't want to do the, the minimum that's required. I want to do something that's good for our town. Well, I don't want to do the minimum either. I think that we have options to explore, and then hopefully we'll come to a middle ground. And 
I think that's what we've been discussing for the last, I mean, not during all of our study sessions is contextual, how the contextual relationship between new development and the surrounding R1, all the single family homes on, um, so I feel like, I, I think. Right, we came up with this map. Right, <laughs> but I mean like measure distances, just, you know, this is where we're proposing something, how is that going to affect it? It's been a repeated conversation mm -hmm. this entire time, and just now we have, you know, 30 more people in the room. <laughs> so I'm, I'm grateful for all the input. I think it's going to create a better product. Uh, can you give me a suggestion would be, um, as I heard many times, and I think it's been voiced about traffic and safety, so that maybe an element we could bring in is maybe we can get some from the police department that they can weigh in on some of these areas. When we look at a specific site, have we looked at safety? Um, you know, what is... Uh, statistics in those areas and stuff like that. Maybe just something we could bring in to enhance and make it better. Yep. Yeah, I think we could look at transportation routes, safety, um, environmentally sensitive habitats, kind of layer. And maybe what the vision of Metro is mm -hmm. in five years, you know. Any more comments? Yeah, I have a question then. So the the December 24 work, no net loss, small incentives, et cetera, w would we discuss that at our August 27th meeting? Um, so we we have, uh, after this item, we actually have four more items to discuss. Okay. Um, but then we did have on, the, on, the, on our calendar a special meeting in August uh, 26th, I think was the 27th. And I'd like to cancel that. Um, I don't think we need it at this point because um, I think we have one more item to bring back to you, second story decks, for just to fine tune that. Um, but we can do that at the September 5th meeting. And then we can, after that, we'll move into more of the housing element once it's ready for the housing element uh, implementation. And no meeting on September 26th. No special meeting for August, the second meeting in August. Yeah, we're. They can they can stay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for your participation and your all of the letters of input. Five minute break. Well, you have enough direction on this, right, Katie? <laughs> yeah, we'd be happy to. Look actually, at that. not. John will give you his right there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Did we speak on the phone today? Did we speak on the phone today? No. Someone called had a similar. We're taking a recess real fast. Okay, one of four for the presentation. We actually, you know, we're we're still in our we're moving we're on to the next meeting. item. <laughs> if you want to send an email, send an email. We're just we haven't adjourned. We're, we're, if you want to, still in our process. So thank you. We're just taking a quick recess. We'll give you, Sean's the project manager on this one. Jerry's in the back. Send an email and we'll respond. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. Oh, yeah, you. it's being developed. By the Quality Inn, there's a, the big open hill sign. It's uh, another image. <laughs> Hello again. <laughs> okay. Um, they're in the back. They're in the restroom. You should go right now. Well, you can go for your go. Five minute break. All right, five minute break. Five minute break. Violet's in the back. Yeah. Don't talk. That's what you're.
Oh, chill. Waiting for Peter. I'm okay. Thanks, Dad. Okay, coming back to every already. No, take your time. Thank you. All right. So, in addition to the RM zone amendments, there are four other sets of amendments um, that are included in the packet for this meeting uh, that the Planning Commission has not previously reviewed. You have talked about them in the past but the draft language is new. And we wanted to give you an opportunity to provide us with any comments that you have on those amendments before they come before you um, as part of the public hearing where you will make a recommendation uh, to the city council. So um, the first set has to do with the housing on religious sites, as you may recall, state law. Um, requires uh, cities to allow for affordable housing developments on uh, religious sites, regardless of whether or not the underlying zoning allows for that housing. And so there's a new section in the zoning code on this subject that allows by right affordable housing development on land owned by a religious institution. And that's straight implementing state law. Is there any restrictions on that housing with the uses for? Uh, well, it has to be affordable. But wide open after that. In terms of occupants? Yes. Correct. Yes. And affordable is 80% of the median? It's, uh, let's see, it's a pretty high bar for religious institutions. It says in the amendments, but I don't recall exactly what it is. But it, it does need to be 100% um, uh, affordable. And then, and so that's straight implementing state law. Um, and then, uh, we also included some site-specific standards for the two uh, properties owned by religious institutions where this housing would be eligible. Um, and so if there were to be an application that came forward on these sites, we have some um, parameters uh, for the housing projects uh, in those areas. So that's the housing on religious sites. So on that one, on the uh, St. Joseph's Church, you're seeing... I don't understand the language. The front building wall shall be placed between 20 and 40 feet of the property line abutting, abutting Monterey Avenue. I'm not sure I get that, what that means. Is that the, so there's residential on the, as you look at the, there's residential to the side, on both sides, but that right. language. What do you mean? Yeah, so I think that there's this existing neighborhood context of homes located on the site close to Monterey. And I think what we want is that if there's housing that's built, that it would um, fill in that existing pattern. Okay, I guess, all right. That's kind of what I, all right. Yeah, that makes sense. I would do the same thing. I'm not sure I understand the language, but if you do, that's okay. Clear. It'll 
and blend in better with the residential area around it if you do that, is what you're trying to say. Exactly right. right. That's, that's what I was hoping you would say. All right, thank you. Uh, since we're talking about the specifics of the housing on religious sites, were there any other questions or comments on that? Okay. And then so the second topic is alternative housing types. This is another topic that we talked about, I think, maybe back in February, um, where the housing element uh, says that the city needs to do certain things related to um, diff alternative housing types, such as micro units, uh, co-housing, uh, uh, employee housing, and so there's a number of really pretty small uh, amendments on the subject uh, that um, reflect prior input from the Planning Commission, um, adding a definition for micro units and co-housing, uh, requiring half a parking space per unit for micro units, listing co-housing co as an allowed use uh, in the residential zone, so there's no ambiguity about that. Um, and then when the community benefits chapter comes to you with all of the mall stuff, you'll see that um, teacher housing has been added as an available community benefit. So prior planning commission feedback um, on these alternative housing types sort of uh, requested a light touch on some of these things uh, that's appropriate for Capitola. So we've tried to do that with these amendments. So any questions or comments on this? Okay. All right. And then here are three other new amendments. These are not housing element specific ones, um, but are other code uh, cleanup items. So the retail cannabis establishments, you talked about this at the last meeting. We drafted language um, uh, uh, allowing for retail cannabis in the CC zoning district fronting 41st Avenue based on planning commission prior direction. Uh, with the office uses, um, uh, we amended the office use section in the commercial zoning district to expand the allowed location of ground floor office uses in the CR zoning district. Um, this was an attempt to take the feedback that we received at the last meeting and draft the code language consistent with that. And then the last uh, amendment to bring up that you haven't looked at before is a statement um, saying that the city will not accept an application, a development permit application for a property with an active code enforcement action unless the correction of that violation is included as part of the proposed project. Uh, this has come up as an issue in the past, and other cities have similar provisions, um, and this is a useful tool in the code uh, de enforcement department. So uh, I guess um, uh, if the Planning Commission has any questions or comments about these code amendments, it would be good for us to know uh, and so that we can address them prior to the hearing that contains these. This last one, the good standard. So this is necessary. Why is this necessary? <laughs> so... Um, you'll recall, like recently we had the mercantile came to Planning Commission, and during the hearing we put conditions on there. We it was it's hard to tie one um, in a multi-tenant building, one tenant who's coming in for a conditional use permit, penalize them for violations throughout a property. This is a typical good standing. Is it good? Is a standard you would typically find in a zoning ordinance that you have to be in compliance with the zoning ordinance in order to come in and apply for an application you have to you have to be in compliance that's not to we wouldn't penalize legal nonconformities um, and if someone was coming in to make their project conforming we also wouldn't penalize them for moving forward but it's it's just to if if the mattress shop on 41st Avenue who has illegal signs that we're forever sending code enforcements to came in to expand, they would have to show us that they're following our sign standards before we would allow them to go to planning commission. Why do we need to have that specified? It, Isn't that obvious? I mean... No, it's not. <laughs> so it'll be really helpful for us to do our jobs 
But if the, the way it would work right now is that if an applicant came in and had a code enforcement um, issue that wasn't, they weren't in good standing, um, we would just continue to go through the code enforcement requirements as well as process their application. So it's it's an incentive to come into compliance with code enforcement so issues. Right now you would you would say you would like refer them to the police department or someone that whoever would enforce the code, but that wouldn't stop them from further going down the approval process for whatever project they want. So you're saying now I now you can right up front stop that process. Mm -hmm. Say I don't even look at your. Application. Say you have to take the blimp off the top of your <laughs> your your site before you come in, and we'll process your application. So it just it gives us a little more teeth to make sure that they're following the rules. Yep. I'm excited about this addition to our code. <laughs> It'll make our lives much easier. And then I guess. Okay. Great. And then, Katie, do you want to review the schedule and next steps? Sure. I think, you know, we should probably open the public hearing if there's no more comments or questions. And then we'll there, wasn't there one other? I thought there was another. We were talking about um, commercial use. I thought there was. Hmm? No. I thought. No? Yeah. The, the office uses the office. and the. Yeah, I thought there was going to be more, more of a discussion on that. Or just, that just covers for you. You think that's enough to cover for the? Um, unless you have edits to the actual language in the code, we we could bring that one back at the fifth on the September fifth yeah. for more discussion. I, I, I think yeah, we got a little bit more in detail. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So I have, I have a few nitty gritty things. I'll just send you all an email about them, but we can do it back and forth by email. Is that okay? Are they? Um, for the region. No, not none of this stuff. It's other other. Oh, anybody? Yeah, please. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then open. Let's see, public comment. Hello. Thank you all. Um, you all have a lot of patience, and I, I appreciate that you uh, listen to the community as you did tonight. Um, I just wanted to touch on a couple of the things that were included in the letter that we had provided to you that are on the what was um, discussed today. I feel a little bit like what I'm doing or what we are doing, because it's a group effort, is just uh, reflecting how we're interpreting some of the changes. And some of the things I'd like to highlight were um, what was mentioned earlier about the micro units being contingent on the definition of high quality transit stops and um, or a, a major transit stop or a high quality corridor, which I don't believe are actually in existence today. And I wondered if the intention was to preclude buildings with micro units uh, prior to those designations. And we know, I know Katie has talked about Metro's work, and we know that through the next AMBAG planning, it would be great for Capitola Mall to be designated as a high quality transit stop. But I just was curious if you're looking to preclude micro units in buildings before that's done. The second thing um, related to what you're discussing tonight is that on the housing and educational and education and religious sites, that's a by right process, but as written, it includes the planning commission. And so it was, um, it put the planning commission in a ministerial role, which is overhead and maybe adds discretion to what is really an administrative process. So we are questioning that. Um, the other things in the, in the letter refer to uh, topics that were previously um, discussed. I think also in terms of the micro units, I didn't see, we didn't see any of the 0.5 unit uh, spaces for parking referenced in any table and asked for that to be reconciled with the parking that you had designated earlier for the different square footage sizes. And just as an editorial note there, still would urge you to reconsider using square footage for parking as opposed to bedrooms in a residential environment. I'll leave the rest for you to examine in the letter. And again, thank you. Um, 
And I just wanted to note that the housing element is due up before the city council soon, and I think that's a really great thing. Um, and it'll get past some of the issues that did come up today, so in public comment. But thank you all. Thank you. And I'm Janine Roth with Santa Cruz EMB. Thank you, Janine. <laughs> nice to see you again. <laughs> um, anyone else would like to speak from the public? Hearing none, closing the public hearing. <laughs> um, okay, we're bringing it back to deliberation once more. Okay, um, I had a question actually to address a couple of things that I heard from Janine's comments. Um, the, I was under the impression that the uh, parking was based on square footage. That's what I read in the municipal code. Can you say that again? Sorry, the, the parking, was, um, parking requirements were based on square footage and not on bedrooms. Just to clarify. Correct. Yeah. Uh, I, we do. Yes, exactly. That's what I did. You reverse that? We do. I'm sorry. I know. I, I just wanted to clarify because that's what I heard. I think our, at the last meeting, so it's based on square footage, and also we were going to remove the covered parking requirement. Yes. Right. Okay. That's exactly. Okay. Just wanted to clarify. Um, and then, secondly, I wanted to, um, by, by bringing the, uh, the buy right, the buy right um, development within uh, public spaces. The say the church parking lot, for example. Um, we're doing that to evaluate context and quality of life and design and architectural features and all those other standards that are important for this type of development. Correct. Correct. That's and why it's coming it to it. It would just be subject to the objective standards. Right, and that's why we're developing this. Yes, so okay. that contextually it fits within. Yeah, neighborhood. So we're making sure everything is, it's, it wouldn't be a strictly ministerial process, but I think there's significant, significant importance in doing that, right? Okay. Correct. Just, yep. just yep. Me clarifying. And as we saw tonight, um, it, it really helps uh, have these conversations with the public and have meetings and review projects, and usually it makes the project better in the end. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is there any other? Comments? Can I, can I clarify one thing about the micro units? Mm -hmm. So um, the way it's written is uh, the um, additional height and FAR for micro units is allowed only if that sort of transit facility is present. But micro units at, are allowed at the um, otherwise existing height limitation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so are we making a decision on these? That was the, you need a recommendation? I think the direction I heard tonight was to please come back with the discussion on commercial on the, for office space. But otherwise it seemed like we're good to proceed. We'll double check on our corrections to the parking um, and whether or not we removed the requirement for covered parking. But yeah, we'll double check that. Are you? It removed okay so that edit has been made great great so i think that the plan will be we'll cancel the special meeting in august we'll come back in september um with if there's any other cleanup items and if you if you would like us to um address anything else just email us and let us know um and so we'll come back at september 5th meeting and then from there we'll have an updated schedule based on um, the multifamily not moving forward in the 2024 update. So thank you so much. This is extremely helpful. Thank you so much. Okay. And when you come back um, at the next meeting, can we give, I know you've been working on this a ton, but maybe an overview of where we are with like permitting process and how many ADUs have come in, you know, from the last, over the summer, stuff like that. Sure. Thanks. Yep. And I'd just like to take a moment to compliment our staff. I think you guys have done a great job in being willing to sort of adjust when it became clear there was a lot of controversy about this. And um, I do think we just want to be a bit more, take a little more time and hopefully educate people and then the process will become a little smoother for everyone. Yes. You guys did a great <laughs> job. Thank you. Yeah, yes. I echo that. I'm not sure it's going to get any smoother, though. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> okay. All right. So um, that concludes this report. Item five. We're going into item six, the director's report. Report. Excuse me. You know, um, I don't have much of a director's report tonight. I apologize. We were kind of working right up to the last minute on this one, and um, look for the Friday update. Okay. A lot of information in there for you. Thank you. Um, item seven is adjournment. The next regularly scheduled meeting of the Planning Commission is on September 5th, 2024 at 6 p.m. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jeannie. So I have the Planning Commission agenda. There is. October. I was just looking at it today. Um, 